Welcome to evening prayers from Stamford Methodist Circuit this evening, Sunday the 5th of November 2023. We begin in prayer, let's pray. Praise to you, voice of the prophets, for giving the uncomfortable words and inspiring the uncommon lives. Praise to you for the gift of simplicity, the gift to refuse the easy lifestyle and to embrace the difficult call of integrity. Give us the grace to be the change we want to see, to look to you for the courage we need, and to surrender what must be given up, and in all things to praise you, God beyond us and within. Amen. It's November the 5th, bonfire night, although most places will have let off their fireworks either last night or in the week before. Can I transport you to the Sussex town of Lewis, where we lived for a dozen years? In Lewis, Bonfire, with a capital B, is celebrated perhaps more significantly than anywhere else in the country. Lewis Bonfire only moves off November the 5th if it is a Sunday, as it is this year. So this year's commemorations were yesterday. This week ends on Armistice Day. And in Lewis, the Bonfire processions pause at the town's war memorial to honour those who died in conflict. And there is also commemoration of people martyred there for their faith in the to and fro 16th century politics of Protestant and Catholic. So the town of Lewis ties together the first and last days of this our week. Christian faith has moved forward in the subsequent five centuries. And in few places now is there bloodshed between Christian denominations though the troubles of the later 20th century in the island of Ireland are fresh in the memory of many of us within our own country. Politics is, of course, a matter for the dialogue of faith. God is the God of the whole of life. And our faith, our dialogue with God should and must include praying to see the world with God's eyes, living the kingdom as Jesus proclaimed it, journeying in our faith, as we learn more about the world in which God has placed us. So it isn't a great stretch on the 5th of November to begin a week in which we shall follow an initiative of the lectionary and celebrate a journey of faith. We shall spend time with the story of Abraham as it's recorded in the book of Genesis and end the week in words from the New Testament. So you're very welcome in this online community whether you're a person of faith or exploring, where you're, wherever you are, and whatever time it is, where and when you're sharing. And so we come to the story of Abraham. Abraham is a figure of great significance, not just for the Jewish faith, but for us as Christians, and also for the Islamic world. And we shall touch on that. But as we begin, he is still Abram, not Abraham. These stories in the middle chapters of Genesis are thought by modern scholars to have a basis in the stories of real people, perhaps kept alive as poetry or as song, passed from generation to generation before being finally written down. They are sagas, as other great faiths have sagas. They relate to what we know from archaeology of the Bronze Age, fixing reasonable dates for early Old Testament events is fraught with difficulty, but it seems likely that we're about two to three thousand years before Christ. And Abram's story travels through a wide area, including Canaan, Palestine and Egypt, areas which later in the Old Testament assumed great significance and still do today. Their importance is prefigured in these stories. Our hymn book, Singing the Faith, has a whole section headed Our Journey with God. From that section, as we set out with Abram on our journey, this is number 475, actually based on a time in the life of Abram's grandson, Jacob, but asking for God's presence as guidance as we step through the perplexities of life. O God of Bethel, singing the faith number 475.
So we join Abram at the start of his journeying, reading part of Genesis chapter 12, and we will find, referring back to that hymn, that he passes through Bethel. In the main, we'll read from Alan Dale's book, Winding Quest, which he calls the heart of the Old Testament in plain English with some verses reintroduced from the New International Version. Here we begin at Genesis chapter 12. Once upon a time, there were three brothers living with their father in the Balich Valley away in the north. The youngest brother died while his father was still alive. The other two brothers married and settled down, then their father died. Abandon your country, God said to Abram one day. Leave your relatives and your ancestral home and go to a land I will show you. I will make a great nation of you and bless you. You will become famous. People will use your name when they bless one another. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all of the possessions they had accumulated and all the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. He came to the great sacred tree of Morech at Shechem in the highlands. Here God spoke to him again. I am going to give this country to your descendants, he said. So Abram built an altar to God there. Then he went on to the highlands east of Bethel and set up camp. He built another God, altar to God and worshipped him there. Then he went on by stages to the Negev in the south. I want to share some of Alan Dale's introduction to the Genesis saga. Occasionally I'm paraphrasing. Alan Dale says this. Genesis is, as it were, the great preface to the story which follows it. It's worldwide in its sweep, dealing with the character of human society and the world which is our home, and with the question of how people ought to live, God being what he is. In reading it, we're listening to people of many generations asking fundamental questions about the world they lived in and working out their answers. Fundamental questions like, what kind of world is it? And what is the meaning of human existence? These are not scientific or historical questions like, how was the earth made? Or how did civilization arise? We are asking religious questions. And religious ideas about the fundamental meaning of things can only take the form of stories or pictures of poetry, in fact. The scientist and historian tackle questions like how and when. The poet asks the question, why? That is why the Old Testament contains so much poetry. The early peoples of the Middle East accounted for the world they lived in by stories which often seem to us crude and sometimes even repulsive. But the Israelites drew their accounts of the world they lived in from among those common stories of their time and culture. But they retold them in their own way and in the light of their developing experience of God. They made great changes in them, for they were using them to express their new convictions. As they went on using these stories over the thousands of years of their history, they constantly revised their understanding of what we would call science but they enlarged their faith. When they came to consider what kind of persons God wants us to be, the Israelites used old tribal stories of their famous ancestors and added comments and notes as the years passed. They were, of course, deeply interested in their own remote past, as all peoples are. These old stories were their only source of information, but they were more concerned with the future, that is, what sort of people God wanted them to be and to become, and how they could live in God's way. They used these stories to make this clear. Thank you, Alan Dale. So here we have Abram. Names are important, and as I said, he is not Abraham yet, Abram. For now, just imagine if you've been living a settled existence, and God calls you to leave all that and travel, without knowing where you'll fetch up or how you'll provide for your family when you get there. And as we'll see, it was even more powerful than that because Abram was promised that he would be made into a great nation, yet he had no direct heir at that time. Was God laughing at him? Was God challenging him? Was God testing his faith? The challenge, the test, and indeed the laughter feature in the story as we follow it through. 
and Abram's response may need to be our response in similar challenges. Churches, as well as individuals, as well as families, can be called to set out on a journey without knowing where they'll fetch up. It may be our situation or your situation right now. So let's pray. Lord God, we are surrounded by a great host of witnesses who have been part of your community, lived by faith in you, and revealed your glory in the world. As we think about these people of faith, bring us into your presence. Still our busy minds to hear what you say to us through the ancient stories. Speak to us in our own time. Lead us in our own lives of faith close to you, in the name of Christ, God alongside us. Amen. And we will share two prayers from our Methodist prayer handbook this year, Hidden Treasures. Living out our calling, this prayer is from the Methodist Vocations Group. Lord who calls us, you are always already ahead of us, yet meet us graciously where we are. We know your name because of your generosity, the riches of your grace, and your unfailing love. May we know in all our uncertainties your faithful presence, which troubles to the earth's end and beyond. As we face the future together, however challenging, may we know it as your future, and know that your rich promise to be with us is the greatest gift of all. May our ministries be blessed with the knowledge that we are fully known and loved. May the shared work of your kingdom, announced by Jesus as justice and freedom, inspire us, hold us, and give us strength. Amen. And a prayer from John Cooper, Director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Creator God, hidden deep within each of us is an unending well of peace. You underpin us a strong foundation. Help us draw out from within ourselves the words, actions, and ideas that enable us to find our place in your vision of peace, justice, and hope. Knowing that we are all created to live and fulfill. It's a gift that we cannot keep hidden, but we need your hand to find. Amen. And a prayer for Israel, Palestine. This week we shall use prayers from the Methodist Church website, which has extensive material on the issues, its origins, and our response. Today, a prayer from the President and Vice President of Conference. We keep silence for a moment. God of peace and compassion, we pray for all impacted by the conflict in Israel-Palestine, for all who are mourning, for all who are fearful today and for what may lie ahead, for all traumatized and re-traumatized by what they have experienced. Enable us, Lord, to stand in solidarity with people of peace, and may your spirit bring peace and healing to this your troubled word. Amen. So we will share the universal prayer of the church, which expresses our belief in God and our commitment to journeying with him and living the kingdom. As always, I will lead using the more modern English version, which this evening will be on the screen. But please share using any form or language that is appropriate for you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now blessing. God of peace, bless with peace your war-torn world. 
Bless with mercy where hearts have grown cold. Bless with courage that faith may grow. May we dare to cross the margins for your love. Thank you for sharing this evening. So may the blessing of God of the beginnings, God of Genesis, the God of good news of the Gospels, and the God of our empowering of Pentecost be with us all now and always. Amen.